find it to work on my computer. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Amanda Perez, and I'm with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Susan Davies, who's going to be talking about concussion management in schools. Um, a couple of notes for today. This is a Zoom webinar platform, so that means that all of your mics are going to be automatically muted. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't want you to participate. So please make sure that as you have thoughts, questions, and comments that you use the Q&A or the chat options at the bottom of the screen. Um, I will be monitoring those throughout. And then towards the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for um, me to present those questions to Susan. Um, and we can uh, answer them as best we can. Um, if there are additional questions that you have afterwards, you're more than welcome to email me as things come up. Um, this is a recorded webinar, so we will be posting this later. Usually that takes us a few days to get that video from here up onto our website. Um, and then we will be sending out evaluations and certificates following, um, following that. So with all that said, Susan, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for choosing to be here today. I know that many of you are educators and you're probably involved in a lot of Zoom calls these days. And um, so I just appreciate all of you uh, choosing to learn more about how to manage concussions in schools. Uh, I come from this, I come at this from a few different perspectives. I do traumatic brain injury research, but I also previously worked as a school psychologist at all grade levels. I'm also a parent. I have kids who are athletes, and I know that there is much discussion about um, concussions and how to recognize them, how to treat them, how to manage them. And when students who have had concussions go back to school, we know that one of the most effective and helpful things that the school can do is to implement some academic and environmental adjustments while the brain heals. Um, but we can't expect educators to do that without being trained in um, exactly how to recognize student symptoms, how to implement appropriate accommodations, and how to um, monitor the student's recovery process to know when to kind of pull back on some of those accommodations. So what I um, want to talk with you about today is how you can do this in a team approach. You don't have to, you don't have to go it alone. So we want to talk about how um, students and parents and teachers and school administrators and support personnel like counselors, psychologists, nurses, speech language pathologists, um, athletic personnel can all work together to help make sure that a student recovers safely. So this training is gonna be divided into three parts. First, we will talk about um, what a concussion is and how it can affect students. And all concussions are different. They're gonna affect students differently. So we'll talk about some common effects on students' learning, their health, and their social emotional functioning. And then part two is going to present to you a suggested concussion team model that has a designated leader within the school building and how all members of that team can work collaboratively with the family, with medical personnel, and with educators to help kind of track the student's symptoms, recovery, and um, appropriate accommodations within the school. And then part three is really gonna focus on those school-based strategies for returning to, the, the return to learn strategies for returning to school. And that will include some specific tools that you can use for assessment of symptoms and then making those school-based adjustments to the learning environment and to assignments and so forth based on what those student symptoms are because every student with a concussion isn't going to need the same things. It's going to depend on um, what's, what's going on with them symptomatically, what age they are, and what the expectations are of their learning environment. Um, and then that part three will also include some resources in how we can monitor the student's um, recovery. And then at the end, as Amanda mentioned, we will leave some time for your questions. So concussions are brain injuries. You will sometimes hear the terms concussion and mild traumatic brain injury used interchangeably. A concussion is a type of mild traumatic brain injury. 
caused by a direct blow or jolt to the head, face, or neck. It can also be caused by a blow to the body that causes the head and brain to shift rapidly back and forth. So if you think about, um, you may be in a, in a football play where there's um, a body blow that can lead to a concussion because the brain um, is jarred within the skull cavity. And that results in short-term impairment of neurological function and a constellation of symptoms. So a few things we wanna make sure that all of the webinar viewers are aware of is that there are probably a lot more students who have sustained concussions than we are able to track. Uh, because a lot of individuals who have concussions don't seek medical attention. Um, they may end up just going home and resting without going to the emergency room or even without being seen by their primary care physician. Um, and then even within the medical environment, um, concussions aren't visible on standard CT scans or MRIs. So medical personnel are diagnosing concussions based on observed signs and reported symptoms. So you'll hear of somebody who sustains an injury and maybe goes to the ER and has those scans done. And those scans are really important um, because they can help us see if perhaps there was a more serious brain injury, if there's swelling or bleeding within the brain that would necessitate um, significant medical care. So a clean CT scan or MRI does not mean that somebody didn't have a concussion. Um, and then we also know that some people who suspect that they've had a concussion aren't reporting. So the, the data indicates that significant numbers, particularly of athletes, may not report their concussions. Sometimes that might be because they want to continue um, playing. They don't want to let their teammates down. So part of what I talk about when I talk with students and educators and athletic personnel about concussions is making sure that we educate the students themselves of the risks related to continue, continuing to engage in um, rigorous physical activity before their brain injury has resolved. And the other thing that I really emphasize is that concussions are not only experienced by athletes. A lot of attention is drawn to concussed athletes. That's a lot of what we see and hear about in the media. But high numbers of students experience concussions from just everyday play, from abuse, from accidents, um, just recreational activities, riding bikes, skateboarding, and things like that. And, um, you know, our very active youth, our youth who are just starting to drive, um, are at increased risk of experiencing a TBI and um, perhaps having prolonged recovery. And some of that is due to um, people in that child's life not um, knowing how to manage a concussion because it is this invisible injury. And so a little about what's going on with this invisible injury is it is an alteration of neurochemistry. Um, potassium ions are flowing out of the brain cells, calcium is flowing into the brain cells, and what that results in is an inefficiency of those brain cells to properly deliver nutrients to the brain, especially glucose. And those molecular changes make it difficult for a person who sustained a concussion to engage in um, a lot of the typical physical or mental activities that they typically do on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is really adaptive um, because the brain is essentially saying, I can't learn more, I can't function, I can't produce the, the level of thought that you're used to me producing because I, the brain, need um, some time to rest and some time to recover. So you'll hear about concussion signs and symptoms. Signs are what we can see. Symptoms are what the person reports. So if um, a student that you're working with appears dazed or stunned or is confused about events, starts having slower apparent thought processes like answering questions more slowly or repeating questions, those are all these observable signs that somebody may have sustained a concussion. Um, another sign that may be observed is the individual may not be able to recall events that happened 
um, right before or after the hit or bump or fall that was sustained. The person may or may not lose consciously, consciousness. If there is a loss of consciousness, it's usually very brief or transient. Um, most concussions don't result in a loss of consciousness. So, um, you know, somebody may only have a couple of these signs and they still may have had a concussion. Some people show some behavior or personality changes maybe more of a um, quick temper, more of a depressed affect. And in school, they may be forgetful, forgetful of class schedule or assignments. Now, if any of these signs are observed, these are danger signs that indicate there may be um, more of a severe brain injury as I mentioned before, some, some swelling or bleeding that would require immediate medical care. So if um, one pupil is larger than the other, if the child um, is drowsy and cannot be awakened, a headache that's getting worse. Headaches are a very common symptom of concussions, but if it's, if it's rapidly getting worse, that's a danger sign. Weakness, numbness, or decreased coordination. Um, repeated vomiting or nausea, again, that's a very common immediate post-concussion symptom is feeling queasy or vomiting, but if it's repeated and prolonged, that's a danger sign. Slurred speech, um, certainly convulsions or seizures, trouble recognizing people or places, increased um, confusion, restlessness, agitation, unusual behavior, um, or if there's that loss of consciousness, even briefly. Those are all signs that somebody needs to be seen in an emergency department right away. Um, so for those of you working in a school, these are really important things to educate everyone in the educational system about, um, especially playground attendants, the, the school secretary. Sometimes those are our frontline care providers when a student has an injury at school. And then these are the four clusters of symptoms that a child might be reporting. Um, we have our cognitive symptoms of feeling slowed down, having trouble concentrating, trouble remembering or learning new information. And as I said, you know, that really is kind of adaptive because the brain is focusing so much on healing that um, it's not able to focus on learning new information. Um, the physical symptoms, the headache, there may be fuzzy or blurred vision, especially initially, nausea or vomiting early on, um, sensitivity to light or noise. That tends to be one that can sustain for a couple of weeks or even, even longer. Um, feeling off, uh, unbalanced, and lethargic. And then emotional or mood symptoms can include, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, irritability or being quick to anger sadness or depression, just being more emotional overall, and feeling nervousness or anxiety. And some of these are physiologically related to that neurochemical imbalance. Sometimes these are situational variables because maybe the child's being restricted from um, activities that they enjoy or they're worried about their, their health. And then we always wanna ask the student about sleep symptoms. They may be sleeping more or less than usual or having trouble falling asleep. So overall, some of the effects of a concussion, those symptoms that we just talked about can flare and become worse when the brain is asked to do more than it can tolerate. So if a child is kind of asked to, to tough things out or get back in the game and so forth, that can make symptoms worse. We also see this in an educational environment when a student is asked to do more than they can really tolerate academically, that um, if they are required to take a long test, really focus for a long period of time, engage with a lot of technology, that can exacerbate headaches, memory problems, irritability, um, all kinds of symptoms. So the, the treatment that we have now for concussions, one of the, one of the main um, kind of lines of action is physical and cognitive rest with a gradual monitored return to activity. This is not to say that we wanna lock kids in the dark room for you know, weeks on end, 
um, it has to be that gradual monitored return to both cognitive and physical activity. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we go into structuring the school-based concussion management team. Um, most students recover from a concussion in a couple of weeks. Certainly within three to four weeks, we typically see um, at least 80% of people no longer reporting symptoms, no longer needing accommodations at school. Um, so what this chart shows is that there is a longer recovery trajectory for people who have sustained previous concussions. So we also wanna make sure that we're having those conversations with the student, with their family, and that we're documenting and tracking multiple concussions. Um, but there certainly are individuals that continue to experience symptoms for um, more than three or four weeks, for months, even longer, especially if appropriate accommodations are not put in place. And some of the risk factors for that prolonged recovery um, are idiosyncratic. They vary from person to person. Um, a few of the factors that can affect recovery are uh, if somebody has a history of migraines or headaches, you may especially see that cluster symptoms of the headaches being worse and more prolonged in that individual. Um, similarly, if somebody has a psychiatric, a psychiatric history where they already had anxiety disorders, depression, sleep problems, that those clusters of symptoms can be um, worse and more prolonged. Um, an individual who has a developmental history of already having learning disabilities or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, other developmental disorders, they may um, have prolonged recovery or especially experience some of those cognitive symptoms with difficulty paying attention, remembering things, and learning new information. And then once a student sustains a concussion, that person may be at much higher risk for both sustaining another concussion, often with less of an impactful um, physical injury and um, often experiences a more difficult recovery. It really does vary from person to person. And that's one of the reasons if, you, if you've worked with one child with a concussion, you've worked with one child with a concussion, that next student that you work with um, may have a very different um, symptom cluster and recovery trajectory. So the, the symptoms and the recovery rates will vary. Um, we generally look at students with concussions as um, able to come to school even when they still have symptoms, as long as the school provides the appropriate supports and accommodations. Um, but we want them to be symptom free before we're putting them back into uh, physical play, like sports practice, sports games, and so forth. So they can get engaged in some light phys physical activity, like you know, walking and you know, carrying light objects and so forth. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking with you about today is how we can have them come back to school in a safe way. Um, an analogy that I often use is the, the broken leg. So a student can come back to school if they have a broken leg, but we have to do a lot of things for that student. Get somebody to carry their books, um, excuse them from gym class, you know, keep an eye on their physical safety. Maybe they leave class early and, um, you know, can get to class late with an excuse, but you're not going to have them running laps. You're not going to have them engaging in sports practice and so forth. So the concussion team model is a way that we can help ensure that every student who sustains a concussion is monitored for a safe return to activity. And um, we wanna make sure that there's good, strong care coordination and communication, not only among the people in the school, but between the educators and the parents and any outside medical personnel who may be seeing that student. So it can be really helpful to get a signed release of information to allow care providers to talk with one another, if there are athletic personnel to make sure that they're in the loop and that there's a good coordinated and documented um, 
plan put in place for the student. And this can be a very emotional time for the student and the family. Um, the, the child and parents may have different ideas about what that child should be doing. Um, the parents may have different ideas from one another about how soon a child should be able to return to school and, and activities. So one of the best things that educators can do is to um, just be really supportive of that whole family unit, to really listen to the parents, um, recognize that they're, that's, they're scared and worried that this was a, su a sudden injury um, that may be affecting their child in multiple ways, and to really have a strong solution focus and working together toward common goals. And then also keeping in mind that there may be um, some significant things that are going on as a result of the concussion that, that the school may not even think about. Maybe it's a 16-year-old student who is heavily relied on for driving siblings to activities and so forth. And if that child's not permitted to drive during the recovery process, there can be a whole ripple effect that the family is dealing with that um, in the school we may not even know about. So this graphic sort of shows potential members of the concussion team. It's, it's not exclusive. And a lot of this depends on the structure and the resources available at the school, as well as the age of the student who was injured. So we have here kind of at the center of the team is the student and the family. We wanna make sure that they're fully involved and fully engaged in the discussion and the decisions. From the academic side, the teacher, or if it's an older student who has multiple teachers, perhaps the school psychologist, the school counselor, an administrator, the speech language pathologist. Then over here, we have the medical team members, which could include the school nurse. If it's an athlete, an athletic trainer, and that athletic trainer also kind of goes over with the athletic team members as well and then an outside physician. So that may be their primary care provider. Um, it may be somebody that they're seeing in um, an outside concussion clinic. And then if it is a student athlete, the um, coaches, and maybe it's a multi-athlete, multi-sport athlete, so multiple coaches may be involved, both school-based and maybe club-based if they're playing within their community. The athletic director, and the physical education teacher. And then here is um, a suggested breakdown of what roles and responsibilities each of these team members might have. These are discussions that you would need to have at the school level because again, different schools have different levels of resources. Some may have a nurse who's there all day, every day. Some may have a school nurse who is only there um, a couple of days a week. So this is something that if you're taking this information back to your uh, back to your school team, you would have conversations about the appropriate responsibilities for a given team member. So these are these are some suggested um, responsibilities. Having that intentional conversation with the student about their responsibilities that is so important that they clearly and honestly communicate what's going on with them, what symptoms they're experiencing when they get better, when they get worse, what classes they're struggling in and how they feel about everything. Because the other team members can put the best plan in place, but if there are accommodations that the student would never actually use, um, then we're kind of wasting our time. So we really need to get buy-in from the student and to help the student understand that it's important for them to, um, to give that honest appraisal of how they're feeling so that everybody else on the team can best function in their roles. Um, and then talking to the parent about the importance of making sure the school gets communication, any notes, any recommendations and so forth from the doctor or even if the child was seen in the emergency room, those um, exit notes. And then to help their child maintain compliance with both medical and academic recommendations. Um, and then some of the academic team members' roles can be 
um, for the teacher to um, help the child in the best way possible and to follow the recommended academic adjustments. Then I would say also communicating to the rest of the team members if some of them aren't working or if they're not feasible in that particular class. The accommodations for a math class may look really different from the accommodations in the student's Spanish class. So um, giving that feedback is really important. Um, a school counselor can be really helpful in um, creating some of these academic adjustments, disseminating them to the student's teachers, especially if it's a middle or high school setting where we're coordinating with a lot of different teachers. Um, the school psychologist can be really helpful in that as well as consulting on more complex cases where you're seeing prolonged symptoms or um, a combination of a concussion on top of a previously existing um, disability or mental health issue. Um, academics or administrators are crucial in helping to direct and oversee a concussion team plan, um, troubleshooting any problems, for example, if there's a non-compliant teacher, and then helping promote that cultural change of setting that expectation that we're going to create a community of care around this injured individual. The expectation is that everyone follows the plan and gives ongoing feedback about the viability of different accommodations, and then um, promoting these programs and implementing policies as necessary. Um, the athletic trainer, as I mentioned, is kind of both a uh, medical personnel and an athletic team member, um, often some of the best people in the school as far as concussion awareness and training. Um, if a lot of this is new information to you, the athletic trainer can be a good person to go to for more details and clarification. They're trained in evaluating potential injuries, making referrals for student athletes, um, monitoring symptoms, and helping coordinate and supervise a safe return to play. So I think often it's because of these well-trained athletic trainers that our athletes with concussions have a, a pretty coordinated return to health program put in place. Um, and th then a lot of times some of our non-athletes with concussions are floundering a bit more. Um, they also will be communicating with the school about the student's progress. Um, the physician would evaluate, diagnose, and manage the student's injury, kind of direct those medical recommendations. They may also make some academic recommendations. And then the school nurse, similar to the athletic trainer, is gonna be very aware of concussions and um, concussion impl um, implications, can help monitor in-school symptoms and health status changes, and um, maybe particularly skilled at helping to determine if a student um, is ready to be at school, if they need a little bit more time um, at home before returning to school, and if they need any health-related adjustments once they do return. Um, the athletic director is key in overseeing an athletic department's concussion um, team plan, making sure that equipment is safe and updated, making sure that there are policies in place that really promote health and safety, um, and making sure that the coaches, athletes, and parents are educated. And I would say educated beyond just getting a form at the beginning of the season that they sign saying that they like read a handout about concussions, you know, bringing, bringing a little bit of a higher level of um, athlete and parent education um, is something that an athletic director can help do. And then the coaches or, and physical education directors can um, help with recognizing concussion symptoms, knowing when to remove somebody who's been injured from practice or play, um, receiving communication from healthcare providers or from parents about a readiness of an, a student to return to play and then communicating with the school about progress. Um, but I think one of the best ways a team can function is to have a designated leader, somebody um, who's designated in each building within the district to oversee the return to learn process, who can act as the central communicator for all team members. And it may vary who that person is. In some schools, 
that best person might be the school psychologist or the counselor or the school nurse, an administrator or somebody else. Um, it's good if it's somebody who is there um, all or most of the time. So like a school psychologist who's only there a couple of days a week was probably not going to be your best concussion team leader. Um, that person can get that signed release of medical information to help uh, facilitate two-way communication between the school and the healthcare provider. Um, it needs to be somebody, rather than saying it has to be the nurse or it has to be this person, it needs to be somebody who's organized, somebody who's a good communicator, who's willing to learn, certainly somebody who's bought into this pro process and as I mentioned in the school most days. Um, in a lot of buildings, the logical choice is that it be the same person as the um, 504 plan coordinator or the intervention assistance team coordinator, whoever is already kind of serving in that team leadership role because you want to know they have good organizational and consultation skills. And I know this is a lot of information here on this slide. This is one of the reasons that I'm glad you're getting um, access to these slides. I'm certainly not going to read this to you, but I'm gonna kind of explain to you overall what this is. This just kind of provides an organized suggested process, certainly something that can be altered based on the team feedback, but it just sort of walks the team through what happens once a concussion is reported, how it's documented to help ensure that we have good, clear documentation of any previous injuries, um, who is going to contact the student and family, when that discussion between the school and the, the student and family takes place, how we can make sure that there's a good, clear assessment of medical needs and academic needs, and that there's a good plan put in place based on those assessments and that then the plan is distributed appropriately to all of that student's teachers. And then step six is so important because we wanna make sure that we're not just giving these accommodations and then saying we're done. There needs to be this reassessment process to make sure that adjustments aren't put in place for an unnecessarily long period of time. So a few of the um, supplementary documents you'll be um, getting access to as a result of participating in this webinar is you'll get these slides, but then also um, a sample academic adjustment plan and a symptom monitoring log. And that symptom log is something that either the concussion team leader can complete on a regular basis with the student to see like are they still having headaches um, are they still experiencing um, nausea or anxiety or whatever the symptoms are um, so that we have that documentation of is this child recovering within three days a week three weeks longer um, and just good regular systematic documentation um, and getting information from the teacher as well. So um, it's, it's a good organizational system if that concussion team leader can, you know, when there's been an identified concussion, start a folder on the student, continuing to assess the academic needs and creating adjustments where appropriate. Um, it's a good idea too if each school can kind of keep this case tracking form, if that concussion team leader can keep a case tracking form so that you can gather good data to say like on average, how many students are sustaining concussions a year? On average, how long is it taking them to recovery, to recover? Um, so here's a little bit more details about that step-by-step -step process. Um, one thing that it is important to do is at the beginning of the school year, let everybody know who that concussion team leader is. Have that be part of the beginning of the year communication to teachers, coaches, parents, administrators, so all these responsible adults can know who to report injuries too. And then anyone in the school community who suspects a concussion should contact that concussion team leader right away to make sure that the student can be referred for a proper evaluation. Um, that concussion team leader 
as I mentioned before, would communicate with the student and family, meet with the student upon return to school and periodically thereafter. At that initial meeting, that's a really good opportunity for that communication with the student and kind of a one-on-one -on -one setting of how it's important for them to provide honest communication, um, follow recommendations, and things like that. Um, the assessment of medical needs, either the concussion team leader or another designated concussion team member um, can be responsible for this. So you might have a concussion team leader who's the school counselor, but then they make sure that the school nurse, for example, is in charge of determining if the student has been evaluated by an athletic trainer or physician, if there's documentation from an outside medical provider about recommended um, school or activity restrictions and adjustments. Um, and if no recommendations are available, so for example, if the child was seen in the emergency room and diagnosed with a concussion in the ER, they may be coming back to school without specific academic recommendations. And so at that time, the concussion team leader or a designated concussion team member can do an assessment of symptoms to determine if it's likely that the student would benefit from being in school or if their symptoms are so severe that attendance is likely to be counterproductive. So often what you'll see, student has a con concussion, they're out of school for a couple of days, then they start coming back for, for partial days or for some core subjects. We'll, we'll talk about those um, recommendations in a little bit. Um, and then toward the end of this presentation, I'll show you this, this symptom log where it says see symptom log. If the symptoms are significant or severe, the student may need to be sent home. But if the symptoms are manageable, not becoming worse by the student being in school, then the student can continue to step four. And at each of these steps, you want to make sure that um, all the process is, is documented. Um, making sure that the concussion team leader has that medical release form signed. So if there are academic recommendations from the healthcare provider, the con concussion team leader or the designated team leader should specify those recommendations. Um, if they're not provided, then um, either the concussion team leader or a designated team leader, like for example, if the concussion team leader is the school nurse, then they may say, hey, school counselor, then this is your task um, to assess the student's academic needs. And I'll um, show you that form again at, toward the end of the presentation of um, academic adjustments. Documenting all of this as required, ideally adding the student to a school-wide case tracking form. And then step five is, five is distributing the adjustments to the teachers in writing, contacting the family, if applicable, if it's a student athlete, the coach, athletic trainer, with relevant updates on academic um, and the, the academic or medical plan as needed. And then notifying the team about, um, about this student's status, distributing the symptom log for progress monitoring if you're getting that data from multiple teachers. And then the, the very important sixth step is identifying the appropriate time frame for reassessment of needs and using the feedback form. So you want to reassess whether you want to keep that same plan in place, either if there's new documentation coming in, maybe from the doctor um, prescribing a different course of action, if there's a change in symptoms, if the symptoms um, have resolved and are no longer a barrier to school participation, if the teachers or parents identify um, problems in the current plan that are not being adequately addressed. Um, and then once that reassessment is complete, document the changes as required and then returning to step five with making changes to the academic accommodations or, or um, eliminating or reducing them. So a quick note at this point on student privacy. So we've talked a lot about care coordination and um, sharing information and disseminating plans. And a lot of this can include um, 
private student medical information. So make sure that in all of this and in your team and your school making decisions about how to document concussions, keep in mind that information on a student's health is protected by HIPAA, their school records are protected by FERPA. So you have to ensure that school staff members are only discussing what's necessary to manage a situation and to make sure that they understand how to appropriately communicate what's involved in a student, essentially what's a health plan in a way that maintains student privacy. And those are discussions and decisions that need to happen at a building level in line with school and district um, policy, especially as it relates to electronic communication. And then certainly this is a process. So part of this process is getting support from the school community, um, making sure that you're keeping it as simple as possible, um, introducing some of these key concepts first, gaining support from um, faculty members who understand and who see the benefits of this coordinated, documented um, return to school process creating opportunities for meaningful discussion and unfortunately sometimes this is coming on the heels of a student injury but sometimes there's no better way to help people learn than to share real case scenarios that have happened um, and then allowing a mechanism for feedback about how the initiative can be improved so i'm going to share some forms with you you may get some feedback from your school community that say these are too complicated or these need to be two separate forms so getting feedback and um, changing your plan as appropriate to meet your school's needs um, and then providing ongoing training and professional development in an easily accessible way, but certainly understanding that systems change can um, can take some time. So, what are these accommodations that we're that we're talking about? Certainly, one of the the um, first steps of that return to school progression is rest. It's really important that that the brain rest and get good sleep. Um, and a common recommendation is limiting physical, emotional, and cognitive activities to a level that's tolerable and doesn't make symptoms worse. But this all occurs along a continuum. So one of the best things that you can talk to the students and parents and teachers about is um, that there are in-between steps between like no activity and complete full rest and full activity or no rest. So students are gonna fall somewhere in the middle of that continuum and going too far in the total cognitive rest direction actually can be counterproductive. And recent studies have shown that that can actually um, prolong recovery. So it, it's, a, it's a process. Um, in, those early, in the early phase of recovery, um, when a student may be staying at home, especially those first couple of days post-injury, it's best if that student avoids extensive computer or tablet use, you know, being on their phone all the time, texting, video games, TV, music, loud music, music by headphones, all of these things that we know kids do when they stay home from school um, can make concussion symptoms worse. So it's really important that the child understand um, that rest is rest and that educators understand that just because the child is home for that couple of days doesn't mean that they should be like fully engaging with school via Zoom or anything like that. Um, all of those activities can make the brain work harder to process information. It can make symptoms worse, thereby slowing recovery. Um, so the physical rest is avoiding rigorous physical activity until cleared by a physician. And that includes physical education class and sports. So you may have students who are able to come back to school, able to be in class most of the time, maybe with some adjustments, but not in PE class, not permitted to return to sports practice or play. Um, so here's kind of a typical return to academics progression. Some of you may be familiar with a, like a return to play protocol for athletes where they're gradually engaging in more physical activity with like 24 hours in between. So this is kind of similar where initially post injury, maybe the student doesn't go to school, they're doing physical and cognitive rest. Um, the family's communicating with the health professionals about 
their, the child's readiness to return to school. The next step may be that they go back for a partial day with some adjustments. They might have like a shortened day or a, a modified schedule with breaks. Um, one modification that I really like to the schedule is allowing the student to miss the first couple of um, periods of the day so that they can sleep as late as they need to, especially if it is a very early starting school because sleep is so important in helping the brain to heal. Then next they may be going back to school full day with adjustments, then um, full day without adjustments, but still no physical activity until the student is released by a healthcare professional. And then that last step is going back to school for a full day um, and with allowing extracurricular involvement. Um, this decision-making chart can be helpful in uh, helping teachers understand the level of cognitive demand that the student can engage in. So if there's no change in symptoms, if you know, headaches aren't getting worse, nausea is not getting worse, sensitivity to light and noise are not getting worse, then you can gradually increase those cognitive demands. But if a child is in class and taking tests, working on projects, paying attention to the teacher, and symptoms start to increase or worsen, discontinuing the activity, completing total cognitive rest, maybe for 20 minutes, maybe they can have a pass to go down and rest in the nurse's office. If the symptoms improve, then they could restart activity. If they don't improve, then discontinue the activity and like, try again the next day. Um, I always recommend front loading the academic adjustments, really like flooding that student with, with support and accommodations and then gradually withdrawing them as the student heals and then mapping adjustments onto symptoms. So that's what the next few slides are going to deal with. Um, and then also having that conversation with how to modify the workload. And um, that is because often if we only have the modification of postponing deadlines. That can be incredibly stressful for a student. And then you're going to see students, especially your academically strong students saying, it's fine, it's fine, I'm fine, let me just go ahead and do the work. Because all that work piling up and piling up is stressful and that can make their symptoms worse. So figuring out what are some assignments that the student just doesn't have to do at all and they're not penalized or maybe there can be some kind of a smaller alternate assignment that they can do. Um, maybe there are these accountable assignments where they're responsible for the content, but not the process. So instead of writing a 10 page paper, maybe they can just sit down and have a conversation with the teacher about the content of a, a book that the class read, for example. And then maybe there are some of these key responsible assignments that must be completed by the student that will be graded. So these are a few general um, academic adjustments that can be really beneficial for a student who's recovering from a concussion. Um, that adjusted school day that we, that we already talked about, um, no PE class, no physical play at recess. So maybe the student can still go to recess, but they're just kind of like, chilling out on a bench with a friend instead of playing basketball. Um, letting a student audit a class, like participating without producing work or being graded on the content. Um, avoiding noisy and overstimulating environments like band, cafeteria, the, the hallways during the regular class change time, especially if those make some symptoms increase. Allowing the student to drop high level AP classes or electives without a penalty if adjustments need to go on for a prolonged period of time. Um, removing or limiting testing or high stakes projects. And then alternating periods of mental exertion with periods of mental rest. And then, um, if, especially if the student has some of those cognitive symptoms that we talked about with the trouble concentrating, trouble remembering and learning new things, reducing class assignments and homework to critical tasks only, um, exempting non-essential written work, giving extended time, adjusting due dates, um, 
making sure that once a key learning activity has been presented, reducing repetition to um, maximize cognitive stamina. So for example, the rest of the class may do 30 math problems. Maybe the student who is still symptomatic and recovering only is required to complete five. Um, I gave the example earlier of allowing the student to demonstrate understanding orally instead of in writing. Um, giving written instructions for essential work so the child's not relied upon to remember everything that they need to do. And providing class notes by a teacher or peer, allowing the effective use of technology with things like a computer, smartphone, tape recorder, so that the child could go back and listen to key parts of a class lecture, for example and um, letting a student use notes for a test. If the child has a lot of those physical symptoms like the headache, nausea, sensitivity to light and noise, letting the child visit the school nurse or school counselor for a little rest break um, can be very helpful. Maybe they can do that if they're starting to experience symptoms or maybe it's scheduled a couple of times throughout the day. Letting that student have a hall pass to um, move from class to class, either a little early or a little late before or after the crowds have cleared. Um, letting a student wear sunglasses indoors or like a brimmed hat, um, or in general, controlling for light sensitivity in the classroom by drawing the blinds, allowing the child to sit away from the window, things like that. Um, letting the student study or work in a quiet space away from visual and noise stimulation. So maybe they spend part of the class time working in the library. Uh, or they might spend the lunch or recess time in a quiet space for rest where there's control for noise sensitivity. And then for students with some of those emotional symptoms, the anxiety, depression, irritability, Letting there be some kind of a plan that if the student is starting to feel overwhelmed, if they're starting to feel emotional, like sometimes a student may just feel on the brink of tears for no apparent reason, letting them discreetly leave class as needed for a break. Um, and then also keeping them involved in extracurricular activities. Maybe they can still attend but not fully participate in sports practice, or maybe there can be some really intentional conversation with a student about other non-physical kinds of activities that the school offers different clubs and organization to allow for socialization if the child needs to sit out from their sports participation for a long period of time. Um, so letting them kind of explore those alternate non-physical activities and having some kind of a specific emotional support plan for a student, particularly identifying an adult in the building that the student can talk to if they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, so some tools for the team. The CDC has a fantastic set of resources that are called Heads Up for Schools, Know Your Concussion, ABCs. So you can spend some time exploring some of the CDC resources. I also really like their concussion signs and symptoms checklist. That's part of the Heads Up program. Um, and those can be really effective for use in school. Again, like if there's an attendance or a a school secretary or a recess monitor that we want to make sure is aware of signs and symptoms of concussion. If a student falls or is injured at school, you can actually complete this checklist, call the parent to take the child to be seen by a medical professional and send that completed checklist along with them so that they can easily communicate to the physician what happened to their child. And I know as a parent, if I'm ever called in to pick up my child from school, uh, it can be kind of hard for me to remember exactly what the school is saying. So getting a piece of paper can be um, really helpful. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna change um, to show you a couple of these other documents that you're gonna have access to. So this is the symptom log that I mentioned. This is just one example. There are different kinds of symptom logs that you might um, have access to through athletic trainers or through the child's um, physician. But what this does, um, one thing that I like about this format is in just one page, you can track the student's symptoms across time and have the um, child complete a self-rating 
of how bad their um, symptoms are in these different clusters on a zero to six scale. And if their child has a lot of fives and sixes where they're moderately severe or severe symptoms, that's an indication that the child's probably not ready to come back to school. Um, but you can track um, cross times. Some schools may say, well, we wanna track these symptoms every couple of days. Um, you may have the child complete this on like twice a week or once a week, but do that rating of um, difficulty thinking clearly, difficulty concentrating and so forth. And then you can see the, the physical symptoms, the emotional symptoms and the, the sleep symptoms. So that's one document. And then the other one are the academic adjustments that I discussed with you. So this is one format for documenting a student's academic adjustments. And as you can see, this specifies um, that we wanna make sure the students can receive these academic adjustments without penalty. So using the student's reported symptoms from that previous sheet, the team would then select appropriate adjustments and um, share them with the teacher. And here you can see that there is both a start date and an end date so that we're tracking how long each of these adjustments are put in place. Um, these last couple of slides I'm going to go through pretty quickly because I want to allow a couple of minutes for questions. Um, just a quick note on if symptoms do not resolve. Um, as I mentioned earlier, typically concussion symptoms do resolve within a few weeks. If you do have prolonged symptoms, the team may discuss whether a 504 plan or in very rare cases, an individualized education plan is warranted. And then rarely a student might exaggerate um, or pretend they have symptoms that they don't actually have in order to continue receiving academic adjustments. So this is often a question that I do get. Um, or maybe they're doing that because they are scared and they want to avoid resuming sports. And in such cases, that's one of the best reasons to have a team because the concussion team can meet to collaboratively determine next steps. And a lot of times if a student has these restrictions at school, they also are having restrictions at home, like socialization kinds of restrictions. And that often pre prevents a student from saying they have symptoms that they don't actually have. Um, so a few of those progress monitoring tools that you have are the symptom log, um, and then asking open-ended questions of the student, specific things like, how is Spanish class? That can help to identify if maybe the student only needs um, help and support in one or two classes instead of all classes across the board. And then as symptoms improve, you can gradually increase the amount of work, the length of time spent on work, um, and so forth. Um, and then after the return to school process is completed, then you would follow return to play guidelines. This is more of an athletic process. And um, as far as next steps, I would encourage you to kind of have as a takeaway from, from this presentation to within your school, designate a concussion team leader, focus on creating a culture that encourages concussion reporting making sure that information is provided to students, parents, and school staff about how concussions can affect learning and health, and um, making sure that your school procedures are in line, aligned with um, the implementation of a sound concussion management plan, making sure that all of the team members have clear written guidelines of um, their expectations and responsibilities. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Amanda, who is going to facilitate some questions. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation. <laughs> um, so I, I think perhaps you actually answered this already because you did go so much into depth um, on different types of accommodations. Um, but Tamara was asking um, if you could talk about the research about certain classes that are causing more problems. That's a great question. And it, it does kind of depend on the, the students and their age. Um, sometimes what I've seen is it's the classes that were already kind of causing problems that get that, that become even worse. So that if a student already was struggling in math, that that may be the class that they're experiencing the most difficulty with. Um, 
I've, I've definitely heard challenges with foreign languages mm -hmm. and with the level of work production in some of our higher level language arts classes, which require, you know, a lot of deep thought, writing long papers, things like that. Great. Um, when students do run into those particular types of issues, um, would you tailor any particular um, response to that? It looks like what she was really getting at um, was like classes like math and English and um, beyond just kind of sleeping in the first couple of periods. Yes, so I think the, the reduction of work is one of the best things that can that can be done. So like reducing the number of math problems, um, excusing maybe some of those bigger papers and saying that a student can produce some different work. Um, and maybe even sometimes it's shifting that schedule around. So you may have a child who is like feeling really great in the morning. Maybe they don't need to come to school late at all, but that maybe some of their core classes can be clustered in the morning and then they go home and they don't have to deal with lunch at school um, or some of those later in the day kinds of classes. Now I know logistically that that can be easier said than done because, because of schedules and teachers and, and everything. And that's why, that's why the concussion team is so important so that some schools can say, those recommendations really aren't feasible for the way that our, our building and our schedule and so forth is structured, but maybe instead this student can like go down to the nurse's office and rest during, um, during some of the like non-core classes. Maybe they're in art that semester or photography. They can use that as a rest period, but not be penalized for not producing that, that art or photography work. Maybe then they can get some like modified or alternate assignments in that class. And most cases, in most cases, this is only going to be a couple of weeks or three weeks that all of this needs to be put in place. Again, why we really need to have a team because it has to happen fast. It can't be this gradual process of like, let's kind of see how the kid is doing for the next couple of weeks. We want to flood them with supports and services as soon as they come to school and then withdraw them. Great. Thank you. Um, I see Melissa threw in a question there. So she's saying for online classes, some of our students are missing the scheduled time and going to teacher office hours instead. Um, yeah, that's a, a great comment there. Um, and then I have a question from Andrew. So are there any resources or do you have recommendations about how to educate students and families about concussions? Um, if concussions tend to be underreported, I wonder about ways to remedy that problem. Yes, so those, those CDC resources are fantastic. So there's a link toward the end of the presentation to some of those heads up resources. So just like quick user friendly um, handouts that are geared toward students and toward parents. And then um, at the end of the presentation, there's a link. So in that, in that last slide that I kind of had to plow through because I knew we were running short on time, when it says what to do now, um, provide information to all students, parents, and school staff. There's a link to a video that I love, and I've showed it to my own kids. I've showed it when I've done longer trainings, and it's just a quick 10-minute video um, that's kind of engaging, and it's a little cartoon that is great to show to students, parents, and teachers that kind of encapsulates what I just spent an hour talking about, like into a cute little 10-minute video. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I know we are out of time, um, but I did want to just say again, thank you so much. And I've had a few questions throughout the presentation about slides. I um, sent original slides to the group on Friday afternoon. Um, for those of you who didn't get it, I will be sending that out again. Um, so hang tight. I will be um, sending out a, a link to this recording as well. So you can pair this together. I know we covered uh, Susan covered a ton of information and I know a lot of you want to go back over and look at it again. So um, with all that, thank you so much and I'll let you get on with your day. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for everybody for coming. All right. Bye. Bye.